Thank you very much. Well, it's lovely, lovely to be here. I didn't know whether to bother to write any notes or not. In the end, I have done some, but really this session will come alive when we begin to interact. But just to say a little bit more about myself, I've been uh, ordained as a Baptist minister for 43 years, and after 21 years here in Chelmsford, I shall be standing down from a full-time stipendiary ministry, but I shall carry on. I'm chairman of Ministry Today, an ecumenical outfit that publishes the only journal in the UK devoted to the practice of theology. It's the only ecumenical journal. And I'm also chairman of the new College of Baptist Ministers, which we're launching uh, uh, next uh, month, which is a professional body for Baptist ministers. And I hope that all 2,000 of us throughout Scotland, Wales, England, and elsewhere might sign up. Well, in the late 1980s, every denomination began to become concerned about the question of their identity. The late 1980s, of course, was the moment when denominations began to die, when churches could no longer rely upon their denominational identity to attract people. And the reality is that today, as far as the average punter is concerned, denominations are an irrelevance. This certainly would be so in my own church, Central Baptist Church. Most of my people are there, not through conviction, but because they feel good to be amongst us. That's what postmodernism is all about. We may not like it, presumably we are concerned for theology, but we live in a postmodern age where feelings take priority over beliefs. Perhaps I provoked you there. <laughs> Whatever. As part of the Baptist response to the crisis in denominational identity, I was asked to write a book for Baptists <clears throat> on why they were Baptists. A most amazing uh, task to be given. Not to write a book on Baptists to encourage others to become Baptists, but to encourage Baptists to remain Baptists. And I entitled it Radical Believers, The Baptist Way of Being the Church. And actually, this was a bestseller. First edition sold out. I then revised it, and the second edition was published in 2006. And I know it's been published into Czech, German, Norwegian, Romanian, and goodness knows what else. Radical believers. Let me quote from the very first section of the book. In ideal terms, the Baptist way of being the church is God's way for his people to live their life together. I say in ideal terms because I fully recognize that Baptists never reach the ideal. Through our own foolishness and sinfulness, Baptists, like their fellow Christians, fail one another and fail their Lord. Nonetheless, this does not stop Baptists claiming that their study of God's word has led them to believe that there is a pattern for their corporate life in Christ, and that the Baptist way of being the church is modelled on that pattern. Hence the term radical. It comes from the Latin radix, root. We sincerely seek to root our life in the scriptures. And for us as Baptists, the Baptist way of being the church is not just one of several options open to us. If it were, then I can tell you quite honestly, I'd have become an Anglican overnight. The pay is better. <laughs> our study of God's word has led us to believe that this is God's way for living our life together. So we see ourselves rooted in scripture. Now you might well say that one of the faults of Baptists is that they jump all the years of church history and go straight to the New Testament. But that's the kind of people that we are. Now, you've used the term distinctives. And the question arises, is there a distinctively Baptist way of being the church? Now, there's an old joke that goes around that for every hundred Baptists, there are a hundred different opinions. And certainly Baptists are not monochrome, with the result that you'll find a wide uh, variety of views amongst Baptists. And yet, for all their variety... Baptists do share a certain set of distinctives. Distinctives which make Baptists Baptist. Now it's important to recognise that there is no one distinctive Baptist belief. 
Many people think that believers' baptism is our primary distinctive. But of course, we're not the only Christians to practice believers' baptism. It's practiced by Pentecostals, by new churches, and many other Christian groups. Or again, another key Baptist distinctive is their concept of congregational church government. But as the very term implies, this concept too is shared by Congregationalists and by some other Christian churches too. And likewise, other important Baptist distinctives, such as the priesthood of all believers or the separation of church and state, they're not peculiar to Baptists, but are shared by other Christians. But it's the combination of these beliefs that gives us our distinctive edge. Perhaps Baptist distinctives can be likened to a set of genes, which, because of their particular arrangement, produce a family likeness wherever Baptists are to be found. Now, before looking at Baptist distinctives, I do think in this context it's important to say that we see ourselves as Christians first and foremost, and Baptists secondarily. Compared with our common faith in Jesus, our Baptist distinctives are as nothing. And Baptists everywhere would happily agree that it is more important to know Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord than to belong to any particular denomination. A great example of that is John Bunyan. I don't know whether you know that he was a Baptist, baptised as a believer. But he was always impatient with titles, emphasising distinctions among Christians. He wrote about other names. He said, as for those titles of Anabaptists, Independents, Presbyterians, or the like, I conclude that they came neither from Jerusalem nor Antioch, but rather from hell and Babylon, <laughs> for they naturally lead to divisions. With perhaps the exception of some little country church in rural Kentucky or wherever, Baptists have never claimed to have an exclusive possession of saving truth. <clears throat> and dare I say to provoke you, we've never dared to call ourselves the church, as you Anglicans do. Rather, we have always acknowledged that we are part of the worldwide universal Christian church. And although we don't have a, the tradition of reciting the creeds, we regard ourselves as heirs of those creeds. And so right from the very beginning of the foundation of the World Council of Churches and the foundation of the British Council of Churches, which eventually became Churches Together and so on, Baptists have been involved. And one other preliminary remark. The Baptist Church is always local. There is no Baptist Church beyond the local church. I have to teach you that, I think. If you look at the introduction to the Revised English Bible, you'll see there that the Revised English Bible was planned and directed by representatives of the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Methodist Church of Great Britain, the Moravian Church in Great Britain and Ireland, the Roman Catholic Church in England and Wales, the United Reformed Church and so on, and the Baptist Union. There is no such thing as a Baptist church beyond the local church. For instance, when I hear of the Methodist church, I don't know whether they're referring to Trinity or whether they're referring to the denomination. But if you hear of a person talking about a, the Baptist church, that has to be a local congregation. Baptist churches the world over form associations, unions, conventions, federations, alliances but they never form a church. Why? Because each local church is self-governing. There is no hierarchy as a result within Baptist churches. Yes, we come together in this country to form the Baptist Union of Great Britain. There is a general secretary, but he, or well, now it is a she, is no archbishop. We may have regional ministers who can advise, but they do not have the authority of bishops. The highest position that you can ever reach within a Baptist church, dare I say, is to become the pastor of that church. 
And interestingly, you cannot be ordained as a Baptist unless you have been called to be pastor of a local church. Now, within England, most Baptist churches are members of the Baptist Union of Great Britain. There are other small Baptist groups, and we could talk, for instance, about the strict and particular Baptist church uh, here in Chelmsford, and I'm sure that you will realise that particular refers to Calvinistic doctrine, and the Baptist Union is a, a coming together of both the particulars and the generals, in other words, uh, the uh, Calvinists and the Arminians. And what really separates Baptist churches from the strict and the particulars is not the particular element, but the strict element. And the strict element is not about their approach to scripture. It refers to the fencing of the table. In other words, they take theology to its logical conclusion, whereby the table is only for those who have been baptised as believers. Whereas in every Baptist Union uh, church, it is always an open table to which we invite all those who love the Lord Jesus and are seeking to go his way. Right. Let's move on. The baptism of believers only. A frequent fun slogan on Christian t-shirts used to be the line... Baptists are wet all over. <laughs> and in the eyes of many people, baptism by total immersion is the key Baptist distinctive, hence the name. <coughs> now, although perhaps understandably, it is the dramatic act of baptism which impresses itself on the minds of many visitors to our services, for Baptists themselves, it is the quality of faith rather than the quantity of water which is absolutely key. In fact, I don't normally talk about baptism by immersion. We simply talk about believers' <coughs> baptism. And we get so angry when people from other traditions somehow fail to understand this. They talk about us practicing adult baptism. It is not adult baptism. We can baptize teenagers, for instance. They're not adults. We <coughs> baptize believers. <coughs> what counts is not age, but faith. And it is a theology of conversion which is at the heart of the Baptist understanding of baptism. Baptism expresses the believer's response of faith to the grace of God. Or to put it another way, on theological grounds, it may be truer to say that believer's baptism stems from the Baptist model of a believer's church, and that in many ways it is the concept of the believer's church which is more distinctive of our life together than a baptism. And incidentally, when we talk about believer's baptism, it is not about, do you love the Lord Jesus? <coughs> Children can say they love the Lord Jesus. For us, it is important that for a person to be baptised, they have felt something of the weight of the cross. Because when we are baptised, we identify ourselves with the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. And we say that we are going to die to self and to live for him and to live for him alone. And so it's not enough simply to say, I love the Lord Jesus. It's something much more profound than that. Now, of course, it is our concept of baptism which causes some of you great heartache. If baptism is for believers only, then how do we Baptists regard those who've been baptised as children? <clears throat> and sadly, as far as you're concerned, most Baptists maintain that baptism without faith on the part of the individual is not baptism. And we would argue that baptism without faith has as much validity as a bigamous marriage. In neither case have the necessary preconditions been fulfilled. <coughs> there is only one baptism, and that is baptism where one Lord is confessed by faith in the waters of baptism. 
Now, I know that in today's ecumenical climate, this kind of approach sounds very hard-lined, if not intransigent. And some want Baptists to recognize infant baptism as an alternative right to believer's baptism, pointing out that infant baptism is accompanied by the faith of the godparents and followed up with faith at the time of confirmation. We, alas, have difficulties with that position. We have no difficulty in recognizing the standing that our, other, that our brothers and sisters in Christ have in other churches. It is simply the right, the R-I-T-E, that we cannot recognize, we cannot compromise on. Yes, you'll find some Baptists are perhaps prepared, but the world over, that is the one point where we absolutely stick. Strangely, therefore, it might seem to you, many Baptist churches, though, have members who have not been baptized as believers. It is a bit of a theological nonsense. Uh, my own church here in Chelmsford is an open membership Baptist church. If people come to faith in our midst, then the only way in which they can become members of our church is through baptism. But if people come to us from other church traditions, then we warmly welcome them and they become full members of our church. Having said that, there are a lot of Baptist churches in this country that are closed uh, uh, membership churches, as we call it, where only those who have been baptized uh, as a believer may become members. Why we're still on th about baptism? What about believers' baptism without immersion? Is such baptism baptism? What about people who come to faith within, the, uh, within an Anglican church and are baptized by a fusion as believers? My practice, and the practice of most, believe, most uh, Baptist ministers, is actually to welcome such people and to refuse to rebaptize in your terms. Because uh, at the end of the day, it is not the quantity of water, but the quality of faith. And indeed, while I have been in Chelmsford on two occasions, I have baptized two people by effusion. One was a man in his 90s, and his wife said, if he goes through that baptistry, he'll end up a corpse. <laughs> and the other was a lady who had been coming to our church for 70 years. She said, do you really mean that what is key is the quality of faith? I said, yes. She said, I would like to be baptized, but not by emotion. So we simply poured a little bit of water over her head and welcomed her. It is not the immersion, it is the believer's baptism, which is for us so important. So, for many people, it is baptism, which is our key distinctive. But as I hinted earlier on, it is also our concept of church. For Baptists, the church is a community of believers gathered together out of the world who have committed themselves to Christ and to one another. And in this concept, we use covenant language. We speak about covenanting together and with God. Baptists do not believe in an individualistic approach to the Christian faith. The very reverse is the truth of the situation. For where Baptists have been true to themselves, then they've had a very high doctrine of the church. Now, it's true that at this point, many people coming to us from other traditions find it difficult to understand what we mean when we talk about membership. I mean, for instance, what is a member of the Anglican church? Is it someone who has been there? baptized as a child, someone who's been confirmed, someone on the electoral roll. It, you know, it's difficult to define. It's a concept that you don't have. Which incidentally makes it so much easier when you deal with issues like the gay issue. <coughs> because you have such a diffuse concept of membership from our perspective, at any rate. 
Whereas in a Baptist setting, there is no room for doubt. I was visiting, for instance, a couple on Monday evening. They said they'd like to become members of our church. Uh, and I explained to them, they already came from another Baptist church, what that it would involve, that two people on behalf of the church would come and interview them for membership. A report would be brought to our leadership team meeting, and we would approve uh, their application. And then, at the next convenient communion service, we would welcome them into membership of our church. Sounds a bit red tapeish, but it's our way, as it were, of safeguarding the purity of the church, recognizing that there is no such thing as a pure church. Uh, but there we are. Um, becoming a member of a Baptist church, what's more, is not becoming a name on a roll. It's a dynamic process. And we talk about living together in community. First and foremost, church membership is about a covenant relationships. So, for instance, every time I welcome people into membership, I say this. I say, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we're now to receive to church membership. I mention the names. I introduce the, the people, talk a little bit about them and all that kind of thing. And I go on to say, in a Baptist church, membership involves entering into a dynamic covenant relationship with one another. A relationship in which we commit ourselves not only to work together to extend Christ's kingdom, but also to love one another and stand by one another, whatever the cost. I go on to say very often, it gives you the right to phone someone up at, up at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, my dishwasher is broken. Can you come round and sort it? Okay, that's, that's a, a silly example. But there are other examples where a wife has gone into a labor and there's nobody else around. And they may phone another member and say, I need you. This is part of your covenant relationship. What is the, uh, the, the scriptural basis for this? Well, I always read the words of the new commandment. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples, if you have love for one another. I then say to those uh, about to become members, do you commit yourself to love and serve the Lord within this fellowship? as also in the wider world, we do. And then I say to the church, do you promise to love, encourage, pray for, and care for these new brothers and sisters? It's right at the very heart <coughs> of our life. So this concept of membership is vital, and it's membership is in the first place about commitment to one another. Yes, it then, of course, is about commitment more generally to the church. Commitment to give, for instance. Or, uh, commitment to serve. Commitment to pray. But first and foremost, commitment to love. But it also links with a whole understanding of authority in the church. Some people say that Baptist churches are very democratic institutions, to which we say no. Democracy is government by the people for the people. <coughs> we, like every Christian church to be fair, believe in a theocracy where ultimately God rules. Now the question is, how does God exercise his rule within the church? Anglican churches, it would be through bishops, episcopacy. I guess for the URC now, God rules through elders, Presbyterianism. For Methodists, God rules through church councils, connectionalism. But for us, God rules through church meetings made up of members of a local church. And this is not democracy. You think of the House of Commons. In the House of Commons, which we call a democratic body, if 251 say aye and 249 say no, the ayes have it. No church would ever make a decision in that manner. 
We always operate by consensus. Believing that God is guiding us, then he will be guiding us as a body. Now we don't uh, say we have to be unanimous, otherwise we, one person could hold everybody to, uh, <laughs> to ransom, couldn't they? But um, you would never, ever go ahead with a decision with less than 80% of the members present say, this is right. And indeed, if you were accepting the call to a church, an 80% vote would not be sufficient. I think, Brian, I'm right mm -hmm. when I said I came to Central Baptist Church and 99% mm -hmm. said that they believed God was calling me to be their pastor. And uh, it means that it sometimes takes time to make a decision. But once that decision has been made, it is owned. So we have what we call <coughs> church meetings. There's a lovely uh, definition of the church meeting in the uh, formal Baptist Union statement of the church, where it says the church meeting is the occasion when as individuals and as a community we submit ourselves to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and stand under the judgment of God that we may know what is the mind of Christ. Now that immediately means that all the trivia cannot come to a church meeting. Because, you know, we wouldn't be standing under the judgment of God trying to work out whether or not we should be painting the church this colour, that colour or the other. There's only major issues that should ever come before church meeting, or certainly in a large church. That would be the way. <coughs> but nonetheless... It is the church meeting to which I am accountable. And the church meeting could fire me tomorrow if it wants. Um, and there's a tension where the church has called me to be its leader, but I am accountable to the church for my leadership. Um, and when the system works well, it works very well. When it doesn't work well, it's appalling. But... I have to say that I, for me, church meetings are an absolute delight where we talk through issues. Some, mostly they are church issues, but not necessarily so. I remember once we had a church meeting on the Iraq war. What did we think God was uh, saying to us? We had a church meeting last year, wrestling about what our attitude should be to be, to be toward the new mosque. Uh, and uh, so major issues come uh, to the church meeting and when a person becomes a member immediately they are part of the inner circle it's a wonderful privilege uh, nothing is confidential apart of course from pastoral ma uh, matters now if the church meeting has such authority and this explains why the local church cannot be transcended by any other body. I sometimes say to people, other churches you can liken to a pyramid. You've got the archbishop at the top, or the pope at the top, or conference at the top, and you work your way down. Whereas we deliberately invert the pyramid, we have the church members served by what we call deacons and ministers. And uh, I am accountable to no one else except my church. And it's my church that determines how much I should be paid, what my conditions of service should be. Yes, they will see what uh, might be the recommended terms, but at the end of the day, every church is free to do whatever it wants provided uh, we remain true to the concept of the church, believers' baptism, and the person of Jesus. Those are sort of three key things. I mean, if I state uh, the, the basis of the Baptist Union, it is this, that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, 
is the sole and absolute authority in all matters pertaining to faith and practice as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and that each church has liberty under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to interpret and administer his laws. Now that is uh, something which for us is very precious. Well, I've been speaking for half an hour. I just wonder whether I should stop here. I, mean, I could go on and on and on. But it might well be that either things that I have not made clear, or you might say, to, what about this, that, or the other? So, Rob, what to fire a question up? I've got one or two things, but we've got some hands here. Robin. This is probably a vulgar question, but if you, uh, your authority is under your church meeting, yes. might there not then be a tendency that you don't preach the gospel, but you just preach some warm treacle that makes them feel cosy and keeps you in employment? <laughs> that is a very cynical question. I have never, ever cowed out to my church. And the reality is that my church has always fully backed me in everything that I have proposed to them. I mean, the reality is that once a church knows its pastor loves them, you can get away with blue murder. <laughs> uh, yes. So, I ultimately, of course, I do see myself accountable to the Lord Jesus. And frankly, if there was to be, uh, if, if, if in all sincerity I believe my church was wrong, then I'd have to resign. You know, there's no sense staying. Um, but no, um, I, I, I could never be accused of, of preaching warm treacle. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I wasn't ever suggesting that you might, <laughs> might that not be part of your system, that there might be a pressure, but you say not. Well, as, like any other minister, we, 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 Baptist ministers are office holders, and they do treasure that as well, even though they don't have the, um, what you used to have when you were incumbents, uh, what was it, the... Um, Free, free, free the freehold, where you could be rude to everybody <laughs> and still stay. We can't be rude. Or we'll be, we'll be tired if we are. One thing I perhaps should say, of course, is our whole understanding of ministry. Again, it's true to say that there is a division of opinion, but I would represent the mainstream Baptist uh, tradition whereby when I was ordained, I was ordained to a particular task. I perceive ministry in functional terms. I have not become somebody different. And to emphasize that, you will very rarely hear a Baptist pastor lead the prayer of thanksgiving at a service of Holy Communion. Uh, we prefer to allow our deacons to murder the prayer of thanksgiving rather than to pray ourselves to emphasize that we believe in the priesthood of all believers. And that, again, is uh, something quite key. Thank you. We have some other hands. Um, Hugh. Just, just a, uh, um, I just want to follow up the blue murder bit. <laughs> um, to this extent, that, that is the, um, if the... You are only accountable to the um, to the local correct congregation, the members, and um, they are responsible for you. Mm -hmm. Then couldn't that, if blue murder was actually on the agenda and generally agreed, who is actually going to um, call that to account? Is if in other words, if Baptist Church sort of goes down some particular trail, it might be a heretical trail, I'd say. They might go for infant baptism or something dreadful like that. <laughs> and they go down this trail. The, 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 then the Baptist the Union could expel that church from its union. Mm. It could not remove the pastor. Mm. Now, it is true to say that we do have an accredited list, <coughs> but you do not have to be an accredited Baptist minister to be a pastor of a Baptist church. And interestingly, our regional ministers have responsibility not just for accredited ministers, well, the vast majority mm -hmm. of us, 
but anybody who is pastor of a local Baptist church. Uh, so although there are these structures and you know there are guidelines in terms of how ministers behave themselves and uh, frankly you cannot be a Baptist minister uh, if uh, you are not pretty conservative on the gay issue let's talk about that for instance uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's down to the local church mm -hmm. and so you will actually find some local churches that could be quite liberal on that, on that. Mm -hmm. Paul I wonder if um, people might find it helpful to uh, deconstructure and our pastoral care. Be yeah. Well, we use this word deacon. It's such a misleading term, isn't it? Um, you use it for, uh, uh, I was say, probationary priests is what one way I look at it. Uh, whereas for us, a deacon is a lay leader. But at the end of the day, what is, what are names? I mean, I personally would if I was starting a Baptist church again, wouldn't have deacons, I wouldn't have elders, I would just have leaders. Um, but yes, what you're trying to say, Brian, is that, again, the pastor is responsible for pastoral care, but that is shared through with others, as indeed in many churches. Yes, sorry. Yes. You, you mentioned communion. Yes. What sort of part does that play in the life and worship of the church? Whether you'd like to say anything further about the style of worship. Every church does communion differently from others. You see, there is no, uh, there may be service books, but there's nothing which is prescribed. So, for instance, my church, we always end up uh, by holding hands together saying the grace. I know of no other Baptist church that does it, but that's the way I like to do it, so it's done. Um, but in terms of communion, most Baptist churches will observe the Lord's Supper twice a month. You could say that our chief sacrament is neither baptism nor the Lord's Supper. It is the pulpit. Which explains, of course, the difference of architectural style between a traditional non-conformist church and an Anglican church. In the Anglican church, you normally have a central aisle because the altar is central. In a traditional non-conformist church, you have two side aisles because preaching is paramount. Um, but, uh, and incidentally, which means that even if I take communion to someone who's housebound, I will always unpack the word, even if it's just a three-minute commentary on a passage before we go into communion. Because, you know, we, we hold the two together. So... If I'm honest, the older I get, uh, the more I prefer taking part in communion than listening to sermons. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that is our tradition. And of course, we don't come up to an altar. We remain seated. But again, that's not specifically Baptist. We go to All Souls, Langham Place. I always think that's the best Baptist church in London. And uh, there you remain seated. Just for clarification, because sometimes people think that individual cups is key to being a Baptist. We used to have flagons. It was when, uh, was it the nine men of Preston, I've forgotten how many of them were, that uh, headed up uh, teetotalism at the end of the 19th century when uh, drinking of alcohol became such a problem that all the free churches decided to give up having proper wine and to have something else. And although no doubt in my church the majority of people probably now do drink, nonetheless it is always non-alcoholic. And the reason we have the small little cups is because some of them years ago dreamt up an advertising wheeze in the British Weekly of saying how unhygienic <laughs> the common cup was, why don't you buy my little glasses? <laughs> um, but that is not... A, that is that's not a key theological <coughs> principle. That is a practice that you will now find. I, I shall never, ever forget being present at a Southern Baptist church where they said, we're going to do the Lord's Supper as Jesus did it. I thought, that's fascinating. What's going to happen? 
what happened is that we had unleavened bread. But needless to say, when it came to the wine, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was a small little glasses yeah. with grape juice. But, uh, yes. I always think it's fascinating that um, in some traditions the small uh, glasses are used, um, and then we're very proud, perhaps in the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, of, of the common cup. And then we quite often use little individual wafers and, and, the, and the loaf of bread, yes. it really should be. Mm, yeah. But anyway, these things, maybe they don't matter too much. I mean, for me, it is very strange coming up to the altar. Um, because I don't have that quiet to think through what I'm doing. Now, this is purely because I'm not used to it. Mm. But it's... it's, it's it, and I, I'm not pretending that we, we uh, in any way observe the Lord's Supper as the Lord Jesus wants it. It's the way we've, you know, we've developed it. But for, our, you know, for us it is... If you come into a Baptist church for communion, certainly you will be amazed at the intensity of the silence mm. as the bread goes round. Mm. Um, and so for us, therefore, coming into an Anglican church, it seems very noisy. Mm. Although I have to say, I, I remember being absolutely gobsmacked. I had gone to an Anglican conference where it was all a very different tradition from mine. We, there was a communion service and I went up to the altar and the priest said to me Paul, the body of Christ was broken for you mm -hmm. and I've never heard mm -hmm. communion personalised in such a way that was a wonderful experience uh, so there are things to learn from every tradition aren't there? Mm -hmm. yes, so four hands over here yes I was just going to ask who was the first Baptist, um, and when, what, how would you date back the Baptist Church? I mean, is it Calvin or John Bunyan? Sorry, the Baptist Church? Got to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> no. The first English Baptist Church was formed in Amsterdam in 1612. It was English separatists who fled for refuge. And while they were there, <clears throat> they were led to the truth of believers' baptism. That's the story. Mm. The big question, which is highly debated, is what was the influence of Simon Menno, the Mennonite, the Anabaptist, who was in Amsterdam at that time? Mm. So there are those who will say, actually, Baptists go back to the Radical Reformation, of the 16th century, um, but we cannot prove it. But uh, I can say all Baptists stem from that church in 1612, and there were two people. There was John Smythe and Thomas Helwys. And Thomas Helwys is a very significant uh, person for one thing. He wrote a little booklet in which he argued for freedom of worship, not for Baptists, but for Christians, Jews, and Turks. Mm -hmm. It is the first plea for full religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Interesting, written by someone who had experienced their persecution. Yes, and that's perhaps another thing I should say to you. We are very conscious that we have been a persecuted people. Yes. Um, when I was baptised, I was actually baptised in Zurich, the stone throw from the Limit River, where Zwingli, the great Swiss reformer, used to drown the Anabaptist women, the men he burnt. And you know, we have suffered in all kinds of ways over the centuries. You can still go to places, as I've been in North Wales, I think immediately, of large open baptistries in the midst of fields so many miles outside of the town mm. where Baptists had to meet together. Mm. It's only relatively <coughs> recently that we were allowed into the ancient universities and all that kind of thing. Mm. So there is this understanding of persecution which has actually therefore in turn caused us to be very concerned for freedom of religion. And it's not for nothing 
that Martin Luther King was a Baptist. It's not for nothing that the West Indies were uh, freed primarily because of Baptist missionaries and their work in Jamaica and so on. And so that is, again, another thing which goes very deep through us because of our history. Although, having said that, if I'm really honest, if I look at many people in my church today, they have no sense of that history. But then I think that's the way it is with most of our churches, is it not today? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm still struggling with the word consensus, I'm afraid. Yes. Because I wonder how consensus really sits with discernment. In Paul's uh, letters, he says some are apostles, some are pastors, some are teachers, mm -hmm. some are healers, etc. And that list, repeated in many letters, mm -hmm. speaks, I think, very much of leadership in a particular form of uh, pastoral work within uh, the nature of the church. And I don't sort of see the marry-up uh, between that sort of theology and consensus. And in actual fact, of course, from the political uh, spectrum, consensus uh, died with Mrs. Thatcher, uh, one might say. <laughs> Whether it's returned is another matter. The, the, and, uh, the, the what, scriptural what, understanding of it for us is if you want to, we want to quote scripture, you think of 1 Corinthians 12, where along with the gift of prophecy, which is said, I believe that God is leading us to do this. Yes, there's interpretation. It's, no, not just interpretation. It's linked immediately with discernment. Mm. And likewise, in James, it talks about testing the spirits. Mm. So people need to weigh what is being said. Um, I mean, I think it... it it's not a matter of consensus, not in how we feel comfortable, but rather, having listened to this, this is the way in which we genuinely believe that God has led us. Now, what about those who feel that we are wrong? I can remember uh, at one stage in our church's life here in Chelmsford, we were very divided over an issue relating to redeveloping our church. 80% felt it was absolutely right, 20% over our dead bodies. And I pleaded with those who felt it wasn't right to take what I said was the Gamaliel option. You know, Gamaliel said, well, if it's of God, then time will prove. And uh, if you are a good Baptist, once the decision has been made by the church meeting, you will not fight it. We have discerned the mind of Christ. Uh, and that is, that is the traditional way in which we operate. Um, but again you know, we, we're not voting all the time or whatever it's a place where, where you know, like, like with, in our church meetings we always begin uh, sharing the news of the fellowship we pray for one another we send cards to one another and only then do we begin the so called business and uh, it'll be there that uh, a minister is called, it'll be there that deacons are elected, it'll be there that the uh, budget of the church is accepted. I mean, it's interesting that the last statement of accounts for the annual year, we just had three figures up on the screen. Mm -hmm. This is how much we received, this is how much we spent, this was the surplus. Happy? Yes. Okay. That's fine. So we don't go into... To, if a church goes into... Questions like, how much did we spend on toilet rolls uh, this past year? I've been in a church where that one's happened. That is a contradiction of what a Baptist church meeting is all about. It's, it is actually an amazing experience being part of a church meeting when the church meeting really works. Um, seeing God work. And so, at this moment, my people are talking about who is to be my successor. They have, uh, yes, my, 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 my leaders put together uh, a person spec, but the church too has thought it through. They know exactly what the Archangel Gabriel will look like. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what will happen is that uh, 
at this very moment I know that my leaders are looking at names. Uh, initially, my ministerial colleagues will meet with the person to see if there's any chemistry. Then the person will meet with uh, the leadership team. Then, if they feel, yes, this could be a fit, they will ask the person to preach. And the church will listen. Very often, it's done in two stages. Uh, a preach with a, with a squint and a preach with a view. <laughs> but, and then it is down to the church uh, to vote. Um, and you said, you know, I said, I said to these people on Monday, you've got a, it's a great time ahead. You've got a key role to play in deciding who the next person's going to be. Yes, over there. Lots of hands, which is great. Um, yes. um, you've um, used the phrase, the priesthood of all believers yes. on a number of occasions. Um, uh, I'm aware that in the New Testament, um, Jesus Christ is the great high Absolutely. priest. And uh, the, the phrase, priest of all believers, as far as I'm aware, is not a biblical phrase. One, piece the, of one phrase that there is, is um, that you are a royal priesthood. That's right. It strikes me that um, uh, the way you've described your church meeting and your consensus yeah. uh, atmosphere is more like the royal priesthood than it is of individual believers. Would you like to comment? Well, our understanding of priesthood is that we all have equal access to God and we all have equal responsibility to share God with others. So we could not use the term priest of a minister. But I mean, the, the jargon that is used today is that we believe in the ministry of all and the leadership of some. Uh, and I think that's another uh, interesting way of putting it. Then you ask, what percentage of church are leaders? I'm told that one rat in 20 is a leader. And I can't find the scriptural justification for that. <laughs> Um, thank you, Paul. It's been really interesting. I certainly recognise a lot about the Baptist Church. I'm not quite sure I recognise all about the Church of England, but don't worry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the one phrase you've used, which is sort of gnawing at me, and I really yes. can't get to grips with, is that phrase, quality of faith. Yes. And I don't think I know what that means. Uh, I, I can immediately see the force of your criticism. Uh, perhaps it's just because two words were Q, quality and quantity. But, but what it, we, we must know that the person believes. And so, particularly for young people, my great concern is that they do not want to be baptized because someone else has been baptized, or because their parents are exercising pressure upon them. Is this something that you really want to do? Um, obviously people can we talk of different levels different levels of faith I'm not sure um, what we are not saying and this is very important is that you have to reach a particular standard before you can be baptized now some of our some people think like that oh, I'm not good enough yet once I'm good enough I'll be baptized Whereupon I say that that is the one reason why you should not be baptized. Because in baptism we recognize our utter dependence upon God. And, uh, you know, we recognize our utter unworthiness. So if I pastor it, then how does that come? If, if a couple are living together, we would not baptize than if they were to ask for baptism, chosen membership. But if they said, but we want to be married, because we realise that we've got things wrong, and then we'd like to be baptised, then very often I will baptise them before they're married. Because the danger then is, oh, once we've got a, a, our life right, then they're fit to be baptised. But the important thing is that they have begun that journey. Um, and um, 
Another, you know, we, we don't insist that everybody has had a conversion experience. We recognize that people's, the way people come to faith varies. But uh, we say, whatever, in being baptized, you know, at that moment, you have sealed your commitment to Jesus. And, and the imagery that we often use is that liking it to a wedding. You know, we say that when a person uh, marries a woman, he doesn't love the woman any more five minutes later than he loved her five minutes before. But something has happened. They've committed themselves. There is no going back. And that's what we're looking for. Um, Um, I guess this ties in a bit. I was interested where you were saying um, about um, if people want to be members of, the, of mm. the local church, that they then are interviewed and then yes. decide if they're going to be members. Um, do you say no to people? <laughs> <laughs> I have never, we have never ever, in my knowledge, said no. Um, Sometimes I've had to say to people interviewing someone for membership, now look, they're still very much struggling. They're not using the language that we would use. But I believe that they are on the way. And pastorally, it would be right to receive them into membership. But, but normally, if they're in that stage, you know, they would have been, uh, 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 been asking for baptism as well. And of course, before a person is baptized, they are prepared. And where, where you, you, you go through, not simply about the Christian basics, about, about living together in community and so on. So it's, it's all this great build-up. Uh, what we do do as well, of course, is once a person is a member, it is possible for their membership to be suspended. You remember the reformers said there were three marks for church. One was the preaching of the word. The second was the... Uh, uh, the observance of the sacraments, and the third thing was the exercise of discipline. In the old days, there's all sorts of discipline exercised. You may be interested to know, in the Central Baptist, I have only ever suspended the membership of two couples, and it was on the ground of their being lacking in love toward others in the church. They've become overexcited, overheated, said things which they ought, no, ought never to have said, refused to apologize, and then the leadership team said, this isn't good enough. We will ask these people to refrain from taking communion until they have put things right. <sighs> As you could imagine, caused uh, uproar in the church. People said, surely anybody can come to the Lord's table. Well, he said, you actually have to be in, what's the phrase that you use? In love and, love and charity with your neighbour. Um, that was a very difficult time. So, you know, so there are times when you, when you say strong things. Mind you, very often the discipline is done informally. I think immediately one woman who left her husband and remained at the church, had been a worship leader, and I went to her and said, for the time being, you cannot be involved in leading the worship. Uh, you know, certain discipline has to be exercised. Uh, but we're not heavy-handed. I don't think we are. I, um, I wondered whether I might follow up with another question that's linked. Um, and my ears pricked up when you talked about the purity of the church, yes. which is a, a, a lovely thing to hold on to, and something that... I'm sure it will resonate with all of us. But I wondered if I might just think it to the, the work of the Holy Spirit and whether you, <coughs> um, as Baptists, feel that the, the work of the Holy Spirit really above all else is within the life of the church, the, the gathered people of God, or whether you have quite a big space for the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of God, out in the world, the, as it were, impure bit that isn't the church. How, how do you conceive of God's work um, out there um, in, in, in the, in the non-church bit of the world? I think we would we, we, we recognise that obviously God is at work beyond the church. And we recognise the kingdom is bigger than the church. That's true. 
And when we do struggle, it's, really, it's, it's all the, it's good to the, point, the purity of the church. Because today we have so many non-conformers in our midst. Now, there would have been a stage when we would have dismissed these people. You know, in the old days, if, if your marriage went, I'm afraid you weren't welcome. If you had a child out of wedlock, well, normally, of course, the woman just disappeared for a while and there was no child, and so on and so forth. And uh, whereas now what happens is that uh, I will with sadness say at a church meeting, marriage of so-and-so has broken down. We need to be there for them. Well, this girl is having a baby. We know that uh, this uh, that, that the children should be brought up uh, by a couple, but nonetheless, we are going to be there for them. And so it's that kind of language. Uh, but when it comes to leadership, for instance, there is certainly very little leniency in terms of non-conformity. Uh, we feel at least there that that should be absolutely clear. <coughs> but, uh, but, but if I jump in, that's interesting because you've played quite a bit on the fact that leadership is a functional thing, yeah. you know. And um, well, why is that? You know, why why these higher standards for leaders rather than the really important people who are the, the church members? I I accept that uh, theologically, it probably is indefensible. But that's uh, although having said that, there's no doubt that. Uh, Paul, what he wrote to Timothy about uh, what he was expecting in terms of leaders, it was all about character, was it not? Mm. Um, yes. And so on. And uh, for us, that, that is key. But I'm just simply saying, I suppose I, I'm reflecting on the fact that uh, we are incredibly mixed today in where people are. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, let, 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 let me, if I talk about the whole gay issue, for instance, I have, we, are, we are clear as a church that everybody is welcome, whoever they are. And we do mean that. But where we would struggle is uh, whether we could admit to membership even people living in a faithful, committed relationship. I know that I have to bring that to my church meeting for decision this week. The majority <coughs> will say no. We've actually had a conversation together. There were a hundred of us talking about it. I, uh, I don't normally do this, but I laid down ground rules. I said, you're only allowed to speak once, no more than four minutes, and please ensure that all that you say is said in love. People got up, they spoke about how they hadn't been able to sleep for days because this whole issue had come up. And we just listened to one another. Um, and I knew that whatever might have been my view, I could not say, we go this way. So church, this is where we are at. But I did say, uh, we, the, we are a church where everybody is welcome. Are we uh, clear on that? Yes. But you see, it's this concept of membership that does rather muck us up on that particular issue. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was just wondering, a slightly provocative question, whether, whether there were any gay people in the conversation that you had. Very interesting. The, the simple answer is no. But three things had happened which caused me great concern. The first thing which happened was some years ago, which I had not known at the time, we had a youth leader <coughs> who told the young, uh, yeah, some of our young people, um, I'm trying to remember the words he used to speak of gay people, it was um, horrendous language, I'm, uh, the precise words in mind. And not surprisingly, a whole number of our young people left. I had no idea what this was going on. Uh, they were an abomination, that's the term. Mm -hmm. So I'd had that experience. But I had the experience of a girl aged 14 who said she'd come out and was a Stonewall representative and wanted to be baptised. And 
rightly or wrongly, after we thought about it and thought about it, and we said, no. We are happy to baptize you as a young person wanting to go the way of Jesus. But if you insist that you are being baptized as gay, we cannot baptize you. But I felt dreadful about that because that <coughs> girl has never come to church since. So, you know, that, that was also playing on my mind. And then we did have a lady who, at one stage, moved into a lesbian relationship and did not come to church. I, again, didn't know what was happening. When I did, I asked to see her, and I said, please, we are for you as well. But she just felt that at that time, she couldn't come. She's come back because she's moved out of that relationship. So I suppose you might say, from your perspective, that a weakness of a Baptist church is that we tend to be somewhat conservative. Um, but um, I can truthfully say that in that conversation that we had, and I was, I was so proud of my church, that everybody behaved themselves everywhere, immaculately, that although people had strong opinions, you know, the whole thing was just dominated by a sense of concern and love. And I thought, well, that's, that's what church is. We may not have got everything right, but we've got that particular thing right. And you see, if I was preaching a sermon, which I know I'm not, but I mean, what I often say to, to people in my church, it is more important that we love one another than that you have preachers who can preach decent sermons. Because at the end of the day, you are the sounding board for the gospel. And so that's what we come, we seek to, I know you, we all do, don't we? Uh, but, but that's the kind of emphasis that, we're, that we seek to give. Yes, a um, question. I'm interested in how your democratic system works in a practical way. Yeah. So uh, my questions are, how many members have you got? Do they all have to attend or do they all have to vote in order to get the 99%? And do you think, how big can your church be? Is your system limiting the number that you can have? Or would you have split? Well, it is true that church meetings in a large church such as ours will be different in character from a small church. If you had a church, my, my wife came from a church with 30 members. So church meetings there where there might be 20 people there were very different compared I have with just under 400 members at the moment. Uh, which makes us, in English Baptist terms, amongst white Baptist churches, large. Mm -hmm. Notice that. I was, I was saying at dinner, mm -hmm. I met with two uh, mm -hmm. black pastors of black Baptist churches in London. Between them, they had 6,000 members. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite something. Um, and incidentally, the only reason why Baptist churches are continuing to grow is because of the ethnic presence. Mm -hmm. uh, we, most of our the majority of Baptist churches in London are black majority of Baptist churches. But then I think that's with all sorts of denominations. No, they... Would that I could get all 400 presents. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is, I'm doing jolly well if I get 80 <coughs> to 90 of them there. Um, Simply because we hold them on a Wednesday evening, commute, commute time, we, we, there are all sorts of, we've tried them on Sundays and all goodness knows what. But there's no doubt that when they come to call a new minister, there will be a, a large number present. Uh, but um, it, 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 it therefore determines the kind of agendas that you have. You make them very simple. Uh, with just very few items t to talk through. And incidentally, I will often wander up and down the aisle, you know, as I'm talking to people. It's, it's not the formal thing, I'm sitting behind a table. It's a conversation together as we, uh, whatever the, the, the issue might be. Um, but... Uh, the, but the, I say the important thing is that those present, the major, you know, the large majority, have to say this is what we believe is to be is right. Yeah. Yes. What, what's the age makeup of your congregation? 
Like, do, do, do you struggle getting young people in? Is it mainly sort of skewed to the top end? We are very blessed. We have uh, people of all ages. I mean, if I, you know, we, we, every week we seem to have a new baby in the fellowship, for instance. We have lots of young families. I mean, like you at the cathedral, I know you're not all the cathedral, it's jolly difficult being a city centre church, isn't it? I mean, Baptist churches are best when they are neighbourhood churches uh, on an estate, if you know what I mean. We find it very difficult if we are town or city centre, and dare I say, it's almost the death knell if there's a cathedral just a few yards down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, if, we, if you look at uh, cathedral cities in this country, there are very few with a lively, large Baptist church nearby. But we, we are blessed, we have people of all ages. <laughs> and because the way that you were describing your church meetings to yeah. me sounds very, very similar to United Reform. And, and the makeup seen to, I originally went to a United Reform, but I've seen the light now. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I didn't, it, even the words that you use, deacons and, and elders, it is, is very similar. The only difference seemed to be is the uh, baptism. Yes, that's, we, we have a lot in common. In fact, there are parts of the country, as you probably know, where we have union churches. Long before there was an ecumenical movement, I, mean, mm -hmm. I mentioned John Bunyan. In Bedford, traditionally, Baptists and Congregationalists, for centuries, have worshipped together. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there's a lot together. But where the Baptist age profile is much lower than that of Methodism, URC, or the Anglican Church at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 obviously, there are great exceptions amongst the Anglican churches, I know that. But overall, mm -hmm. um, it is very worrying, is it not? But then again, we, we've still got the same problem. How we win people for Jesus in such a secular society? Mm -hmm. I'd love to... Um, sorry, sorry yeah, just, just on that very point. Yeah. So what conclusions have you drawn as to why there's that difference of age profile? I think because we have... At the end of the day, said so we want to do church in such a way that we can win others for Jesus Christ. So when it comes to talking about worship, for instance, we consciously have said to ourselves that we're not necessarily going to sing hymns which we all love. We need to be willing to put those to one side. For instance, we, re we pay £2 million to redevelop our premises here in uh, central Chelmsford. It wasn't to make it a more comfortable place for us. We were used to sitting in uncomfortable pews in a dark, depressing worship area. But we said, if we're going to win others for Jesus Christ, we've got to change. And I think that's been, it's been that driving sense of evangelism which has characterized Baptist churches, which has perhaps made that difference. Uh, but we still struggle. Can I ask where the money came from for the, the millions to, to change the church? Fundraising or...? No, fundraising was a dead loss. <laughs> because you go to enormous effort and you'd raise perhaps three or four thousand pounds. Yes. Brian was very much involved in our church at the time. But what we, we, what we did, we had, and we had no wealthy people. We had nobody, no bankers. I mean, our sociological profile is very different from the cathedral. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the leadership team challenged the church to double time. Now, that was a shock to the system, because the truth is most people hadn't tithed, let alone double tithed. There were even people who treble tithed. And uh, I have never seen a miracle in my life. I thought I once saw someone heal, but then the healing went back to it. But I saw a miracle of giving. I did not believe it possible. And what happened to our church was this. By the time we, we had agreed to go ahead, because of all this, the 20% who were so upset about things, we'd become pretty dysfunctional. But as a result of people literally laying their lives on the line financially, we became a united and outward looking church. 
by the time that, you know, we, we, we had been declining as a church, and I managed to take the church right down to 250 members. <laughs> and it was a horrible experience. Mr. Church Decline, I felt I was. <laughs> but that experience of a building project, and I cannot believe it, because I used to be very rude and say, you know, if the minister's seen nobody saved, then they build a building. You know, I was always rude about people who were into buildings. But we, we were renewed. And we were changed. I mean, the same people are still with us now. I'm actually different from what they were. We're all different. It, it's an amazing story. So, I mean, traditionally Baptists, compared to some churches, have been good in giving. I mean, you just think at the moment. We have four ministers uh, to support. We, and the, the, all, all the other par paraphernalia, and no help from outside, no investments, no nothing. And as I say, there is nobody, we've got no big banker, nobody like that at all. Uh, so it, it came out of this, but this is what happens when you are, as a local church, you take responsibility for your life together. Mm. Mm. And uh, I mean, I never ever want to go through that experience again. Mm. At one stage I felt I was pastor of the Paul Beasley Murray Martin Memorial Church. <laughs> because when you put your head above the parapet, you know what happens brothers, don't you? Yes. Um, but in the end, it was so right. And uh, the lovely thing has been that some people came back to the church afterward and said, sorry, we got it wrong. And that really gave me immense satisfaction. I have gone on far too long. Well, no, I think there might just be time for one last little comment, sort of question from me, if that's okay. Um, my, my parish, before I moved here to Chelmsford a couple of years ago, I was in a town called Didcot. Indeed. Um, in, in we made a disastrous Chelmsford. decision <laughs> well, to move our resource centre out of London to Didcot. <laughs> that, that was a decision made, I suppose, by the Baptist Union. Obviously, there's no hierarchy or headquarters sets about. <laughs> no, it is not about headquarters. No, so, um, resource centre. You some kind of it. gathering of people That's decided right. to, yes. to make that move. Indeed. But the headquarters was... Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Baptist House was on the site of the former vicarage of my parish. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, um, which is an interesting little quirk. Yes. And occasionally I would go and lead prayers at Baptist yes. House, which was a great yes. privilege for me. And many wonderful people yes. and close friends um, mm -hmm. uh, worked there. Um, but my experience at Didcot was very interesting for a couple of reasons mm -hmm. that I thought I might just flag up in a, in a final um, way. Um, one was, in the town, there was um, a formal ecumenical project mm -hmm. between um, the local Baptist church and the, uh, one of the local Anglican parishes, mm -hmm. and it was the Lady Grove Church. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, they ended up with Anglican ministers for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but it was meant to be, it was, an ecumenical mm -hmm. partnership mm -hmm. between uh, the Baptists mm -hmm. and the Anglicans. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I was to ask a final question, it might be, does that make sense theologically for you? Uh, and I'm tempted to leave it at that. But, but the, other, the other thing that I really was inspired by was the um, Didcot Baptist Church, which was very, a very strong church, a vibrant church. Many of the people who worked at Baptist House worshipped there, lived in the town. Um, they, they led the way ecumenically in terms of outreach into the town, not so much evangelism, but actually service. Um, helping fund uh, outreach youth work, um, litter picks, all that sort of stuff that you kind of feel the Anglicans ought to have been good at. We weren't. We followed behind um, the pastor and the others at the, at the Baptist church. And in a sense, you were uh, in that place. You were the, the church for the community in a way that was, was quite striking for me. Um, so I just wondered if you wanted to make any final comments to those two rather different observations. My greatest experience of humanism was that initiated by President Mobutu in Congo, one of the most corrupt men of the 20th century. Overnight, he united the Protestant church. Overnight, we all became the Church of Christ in Zaire. And then, brackets, Methodist community, <laughs> Baptist community. Mind you, it did work more easily there, because long before that happened, there had been the, uh, the arrangement 
whereby the whole country was divided up amongst the denominations. <laughs> so if you lived along the River Congo, of course, you had to be a Baptist. There were no other churches than Baptist churches. <laughs> if you lived in the Kasai, you had to be a Presbyterian. If you lived in Katanga, you had to be a Methodist. <laughs> Talk about theology gone wonky. <laughs> but, uh, but it really was a lo- be more serious. It really was a lovely thing to see Church of Christ in Zaire. And if I talk about where we are today, although there is no structural unity, make no doubt, have no doubt amongst yourselves that we are affected by you, and perhaps vice versa. And when, dare I say, as Anglicans, you have your fights, it hurts us. Mm. And we believe it hurts the cause of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, the thing which thrilled me so much a number of years ago was when we were able to ho- have two Christian festivals here in this uh, mm-hmm. town city. I long for that to happen again, mm-hmm. where we can say to the people of Chelmsford that though we may do church differently, mm-hmm. we are one in our love for the Lord Jesus and our desire to serve the world for him. So can I end up with that? Thank you so much.